Troy City Council Special Study Session, dated November, uh, April 30th, 2012, for the um, budget continuation has begun. Roll call, please, Mrs. Bittner. Mayor Daniels. Here. House Member Campbell. Here. Council Member Fleming. Here. Council Member Henderson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem McGinnis. Here. Council Member Slater. Here. Council Member Seed. Here. Quorum present. Discussion item. Mr. Darling, are you prepared to start? I am prepared, Madam Mayor. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, thank members you. of council, uh, residents of the city of Troy. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight to go over the uh, budget presentation for the 2012-13 budget. Um, welcome back and my condolences as we go through this. It's uh, a time tedious process, but it's very important work that uh, we need to do tonight. I'm gonna start off uh, <coughs> with, uh, whoops learning how to work this thing. Uh, there we go. Uh, as you know, uh, in our April 23rd meeting, we went through an Mr. overview Darling. of the budget, the general fund, special revenue. Excuse me, Mr. Darling. We, we don't have a copy. Seats? Yes, we will be getting a copy to you. They're being made as as we speak. So okay. uh, I will slow down. No, no, no. I, and just so I can have a up. note to make, but they, they are on their way. They're uh, single-sided tonight. So. And, and Tom, if I may. Yes. Um, you're going to find some differences between handouts that you received last week and this week. Certain things changed that both Tom and Nino Lakari can allude to, but we decided that we'd rather be accurate than consistent. So there, there are updates, it's a fluid document. So if you see a difference from what you received last week as opposed to this week, it's because we have more accurate information. And we'll go over there. Nothing in totals, but some allocations really between an assigned and unassigned. We'll get more into that detail. Again, uh, last week uh, we went through an overview, talked about the general fund, special revenue funds, internal service funds, and the debt service fund. Tonight, <coughs> our, our goal is, is to uh, complete our special revenue funds by talking about our two new ones, which is the library and drug forfeiture fund, along with uh, starting our uh, discussions on capital projects, enterprise funds, and our three-year budget all in order to uh, be ready for our public hearing and adoption on May 7th. Okay. Looks like we've got handouts and we can proceed. Again tonight we're talking about uh, the LDC E3, Library, Drug Forfeiture, Capital Projects, Enterprise Funds in our three-year budget. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with uh, the Library Fund. Again, uh, we're going to start uh, with our tax revenues. A as we talked about last week, uh, we still have a declining stream in our taxable values, which equates to uh, lower tax revenues being generated. Overall, uh, we're looking at about 3.2 million uh, of revenues to fund our operations. Of that, uh, we're going to spend about 2.4 million in the operations of the library, leaving about uh, 6.9 million available for to, to fund uh, basically the books and audiovisual equipment that makes the, the quality of our uh, of our programs there. <coughs> That's a lot of money. Well, it is. No, it's 690,000. Yes, 690,000. Just to put it in relation. Um, Ms. Russ, can you tell us what the budget for that used to be? Yeah, um, sure. The, the materials budget for many, many, many years was 775000 which for our community of choice population is, a, is definitely in the ballpark um, for what you would want it to be. Um, it was $775,000 when I became director in 2007, and it was $775,000 per year until um, fiscal year 2010-2011. When the library had the $1.4 million budget cut, it went to $425,000. Um, with the passage of the millage, we were able to restore the materials <coughs> budget to $520,000, which is um, definitely appreciated by our patrons and a step in the right direction. It's still about $250,000 less than it was for many years, but it's definitely an improvement over $425,000. I think the idea is that we're trying to get back at least to that quality level yes. of materials in our life. Okay, thank you. Next, let's talk about the drug forfeiture fund. The drug forfeiture fund is, again, uh, very new for this year. Uh, basically, uh, these funds were housed in the general fund, but because uh, uh, they've actually 
gained to be somewhat substantial, uh, we wanted to segregate them and account for them in their own fund. Because they are uh, earmarked for uh, certain only specific types of expenditures that they can be uh, sent on, and that's primarily and only in the police department, and that's related to uh, training and certain capital expenditures. Again, we can't use these funds for operations, but only for what they are specifically earmarked for. Again, we uh, are budgeting about 584,000 of drug forfeitures during the year. Of that, really, 206,000 is the transfer of, of resources that we had in the general fund that we're transferring over to establish uh, this fund to begin with. So really only about 378,000 will be generated, or at least for budgeting to be generated from uh, seizures. Okay. Next, let's go ahead and talk about the capital projects fund. Any, any question on our two uh, new special revenue funds before we go forward? Yes. Just a question. How do you estimate the fines and forfeitures for 2013? Is that just on prior history? or that Basically, we use uh, what uh, several different tactics, but most of it is on a trend analysis of what we receive uh, and projections that we're estimating for 2012 and trying to project those out. What's the yeah. process for changing the earmarks? Can we um, expand what this money can be used for in some way? Excellent question. Uh, perhaps. Well, actually, you know, what that money can be used for governed by the Department of Justice guidelines. Um, it can't be used for supplanting to use uh, to pay for other things that already were included in the budget, but they can be used for new purchases. Not operations. Uh, right. Again, we can not supplant right. officers or use for those type of funds. Again, it's only equipment and training type. Uh, over time, as it relates to specific assignments, yes. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and, and get into the capital project fund. Again, we're proposing a, a millage to remain stable to prior years at a 1.53. Uh, mills. That basically equates uh, for 2013 about $6.5 million. We're going to go through uh, several different schedules, including revenues and expenditures, uh, expenditures by department. We're going to give you uh, some maps to look at. Again, those are in your uh, budget materials, too, about the projects and, and where we're going to be doing uh, the location of these projects. And we're going to talk about expenditures by object. Again, for all of our capital projects, not just the capital project fund, again, this is an overview, but including the water system, the sewer system, fleet and maintenance, <coughs> we are uh, budgeted to spend about $25.9 million in capital. Okay? Of that, $17.9 million is, is budgeted to come out of the capital project fund, uh, $5.1 million uh, in water improvements, 1.8 million in sewer improvements and about 102,000 in golf courses. Okay. And again, we're going to get into the capital in, in a little more detail. If we look at it at, at, at the type of purchases that we're going to make or we're budgeting or proposing, again, as we said, about 5.1 million in the water system, <coughs> 1.8 million in our sewer system, uh, land improvements. Building improvements of 1.1 million. Of that, 1.1 million, 6.3 million will be for the transit center. And again, we'll get into more detail of what makes all of these up. This is, again, kind of a big, broad overview. Um, another one that's worth noting is the 8.4 million. That's really for your streets, your drains, and your sidewalks. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about some of the high profile projects. Now, I'm just going to take that. Do I have to take it offline? Yeah. That was good. Yeah, so can you backspace, please? There we go. And arrow down and. Okay, across the back space. There we go. Okay, now you're looking at what I'm looking at. Okay, so some of the high profiles, again, uh, major roads about uh, of uh, 3.7 million. Back up local roads about 3.1 million. 
Uh, water mains of 5.1 million. Of course, the transit center of 6.2 million. And our sewers of about 1.8 million. Again, those are some of the high profile projects that we got going on uh, for 2013. All right, now let's start picking apart some of the uh, uh, specifics. Under land improvements, uh, we're budgeted about $200,000. And that's really all related to uh, uh, municipal parking lot improvements. Uh, we got a budget in there about 231000 Continuing with uh, building improvements of about $7.1 million. Again, fire station uh, two. Um, it's budgeted for uh, HVAC system, about 10,000. Uh, the historic village uh, upgrades are 50,000. And again, this is by contract uh, with the, uh, um, with, uh, the uh, historic village per contract that we need to budget 50,000 for capital per year. Yes. Station two is, is where? I forget, I apologize. 5,600 Livernoy okay. between 18 Mile and Swirly. Continuing uh, with building improvements, again, I, had, I don't know what's, it wasn't like that way to go, but that's, that's too bad. Well, whoops, I'll see. Sometimes no matter how far ahead you plan, it, it, uh, and until that plane takes off, you sure what you're going to get. Again, the big thing under building improvements, 7.1 million in total. 6.3 uh, million of it's for the transportation center. We have 80,000 uh, to replace the electrical feed cable to uh, basically the uh, city campus. Uh, we always budget about uh, 200,000 for emergency repairs that are unanticipated. And uh, that's under general government. Parks and Rec, uh, we have a community center annex renovations of 300,000. Again, I think 150,000 of that is for the roof. 150,000 for roof uh, and 150,000 for uh, HVAC units. And wrap up uh, building improvements uh, under public works. Uh, we have uh, the fuel island needs uh, some repairs in the tune of about 15,000. Uh, roof replacement of 102,000 and these general repairs of 73,000. I'm not sure why it's acting like that, but hopefully we'll get through it. Okay, equipment, under equipment, basically we have uh, three different um, <coughs> types. We have uh, shop equipment in our uh, fleet maintenance, uh, basically for uh, general tools and, and, and upgrades uh, being budgeted for 49,000. For general equipment, Again, the fire department uh, is budgeted at, uh, uh, at 5,000, and that's uh, primarily for radios. Again, police departments at 240,000. I believe that's primarily for radios to, and for the cars, the upgrade for that system. Is that right, Chief? Biometric inventory and some car vehicle and MDC equipment. Very good, thank you. Streets, uh, again, a minor amount of 44,000. Uh, for, again, general equipment and about 5,200 uh, for fleet maintenance. Office equipment, uh, the only office equipment that we uh, have in our budget is, is for the library of 30,000, and that's really uh, for self-checkout machines. Again, this capital improvement is funded uh, through the library. The, we expended out of the capital project fund, and it's reimbursed out of the, gen out of the library fund. Next, let's talk about vehicles. Um, vehicles, so we budgeted uh, about 900,000 uh, to replace uh, vehicles through our fleet maintenance. The detail of that can be uh, found on page 238 uh, of your budget um, document, but primarily uh, this is to replace approximately 13 police cars, uh, about three four by four uh, vehicles for both police and fire. Uh, the other major one in this is a 5x7 dump truck and um, a 10x12 dump truck for that. Uh, not to be outdone, the fire department uh, needs a uh, new pumper to be placed into 2-2 in tune of about uh, 570000 
Next, let's talk about public works construction. Again, this is the major uh, emphasis of the of the capital project fund. Uh, it's, we're budgeting uh, 8.5 million related to these types of projects, major roads. Three point, and we'll get more in detail of these, but 3.7 for major roads, 3.1 for local streets, um, sidewalks at about 500,000, and drains at about 1.1 million. <coughs> Okay, so let, we're going to go ahead and talk about major roads first in a, in a little more detail. Major roads, this is basically we're looking at the current year that we're budgeting for plus uh, five years into the future. If I, I can use my calculator right there, it adds up to about 28.2 million in total over the next six years. Um, and these projects can be, uh, again, uh, we'll talk in a little more detail on the next page of what makes these up. Again, this is a map. This is found on page 173, which highlights uh, where these maintenance products, projects are going to be located uh, with inside the city. And, and to the degree that we're going to have expenditures related to these projects. Again, the, all that detail is on uh, page 173 in your budget packet. Okay, overall, and I'm not sure if you want to kind of elude on these next three grants, Mr. Lutery and or Mr. Vendette. I'll, uh, I'll let him talk about, that's uh, what my, that's what says to turn over to Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about uh, how the budget relates and the condition of our roads. Okay, what, what we looked at, this is really budget scenarios if we're looking at different levels of funding because what we've uh, been looking at is kind of a combination of our majors. Um, industrial roads are a subset of the major road budget and then locals are the, part of the local road fund. Um, what you'll see if you look at the detail in the six year capital in the spreadsheet as well as the explanations is that we're making a concerted effort to improve the quality of our majors. They're, Right now, they're in the fair range. Um, over the next six year capital, uh, we're looking to overlay Square Lake in its entirety as well as Waddles in its entirety. Um, what we're doing is taking advantage of a couple years where we don't have big reconstruction projects, as well as you'll, on the next slide, you'll see our industrial roads are in uh, a, a higher fair condition than a good condition. Um, and that's because we've spent the last several years um, putting a lot of money towards our industrial roads. So they're in a much better condition. Our local should, or our major roads should be trending up over the six year. Our industrials pretty much will stay steady, maybe trend down a little bit, but at the end of the six years, we expect that both will be in kind of a mid to high fare range. What, what would be an example of one of the industrial roads? Uh, Northfield Parkway, something like that. Yeah, it's something more than a, more than a local, less than a major. And the, the budget numbers don't necessarily correlate with what's in the budget. What you'll see is that industrials, uh, 13 is budgeted at a million, and then it goes down to about half a million over the, the end. And previously, we had been budgeting about two million a year for industrials, and that's why we've got them up into a, uh, a state that they are currently in. Um, you'll see this. One point on the majors, there was kind of a jump in there in that third year. We went from kind of the three range to the five range. That's when we start hitting our, our big reconstruction projects again. So although there's a bump in that number, it's not necessarily a bump or an increase in city dollars because there, there starts to be a large amount of federal dollars coming in, coming in to pay for the reconstruction of the John R's. Dequinda right after that, Livernoy after that, and then the next phase of Rochester after that. So we've got kind of a lull here for a couple of years, and then we're going to get back into them heavy again up in the northeast quadrant. Um, locals hold steady at 3.15. Um, again, there's detail in the budget on all the projects. We're kind of in a different situation with locals. We're, we're trending down. Um, I think you all saw the document we did based on PACER ratings and dollars. Um, what we budget roughly three million a year. What we looked at in order to bring our system up into a good condition and maintain it there is about nine million, so about three times what we budget annually to get it up in that condition. We know we're not going to get to that dollar amount, um, but at the three million level, we uh, we foresee us trending down. I, we, I think 
we think we'll still be in the fair range but eventually we'll start to start touching on that poor range at this three million dollar level thank you Mr. any questions i got one. <laughs> could you uh dial back to slide 21 please These are the conditions of major roads that are known as city major roads. Mm -hmm. And we also have more county major roads. Mark, what are the county major roads? Oh, um, Big Beaver, I believe Long Lake, um, South, South Fulton, and then um, Maple. Maple, and then Crooks. Crooks, yep. John Adams. John Adams. John Adams. John Adams. These are all roads that are not on the city system because they're under the purview of Oakland County Road Commission. Now, if I were to ask Bill or Steve, <laughs> what road, what condition of roads do you think uh, would fall that are county roads? Would it be good, fair, or poor? <coughs> fair, trending, poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't have a slide of this, but this is a this chart shows what the projected condition is in 2016 and all the red on this uh, map of Troy are all county roads mm -hmm. and those that's uh, in a poor condition all the blue is in good and all the green is in fair so cities are either good or fair counties at these locations are expected to be in poor condition so to offer an historical perspective since the beginning of Troy we have paid as an organization in the community more money to <coughs> fix, repair, and build county roads than Oakland County spent to fix, build, and repair county roads in Troy. <coughs> we no longer have that capability, so there's going to be a, an issue that's, that's currently in place that's going to get worse, not to be an alarmist, but county roads are going to get worse in Troy, uh, all over the county. So when you see a slide that talks about city roads, with our funding, we're going to be okay on city roads, but we're not going to be okay on the condition of county roads. Point. Thank you. Question. I understand what you're saying about the county roads, but what can we do as a city to assist the county in getting funding, because we know the county doesn't have the money, the city doesn't have the money, but there are some federal funds available. What role do we play in assisting the county in obtaining federal funds or grants that will be used on these county roads? Troy is a member of the funding committee and mm -hmm. the representative for large communities. So we do, I mean, we meet twice a year to dole out the funds. Everything's done on a, a rating system, so it's everything gets submitted. Um, gets ranked. I'm on the ranking committee as well. I rank projects. Um, the county has two projects in Troy this year. Uh, Livernoy Big Beaver to Waddles, which is a mill and overlay essentially, and then 14 Mile Campbell to Stevenson. After that, the county really doesn't have any maintenance type projects. They've got some fu future projects on Dequinder, which is a reconstruct a five lane, and on Livernoy, which is also a future reconstruct to a five lane. We have projects on the county roads that Troy <coughs> need agency on two miles on John R., a mile on Livernoy, and then a city project on Rochester. Those are all big reconstruct, widening and reconstruct projects. Straight up maintenance jobs. Um, part of the problem is, is when you try and rate a, a repair of a five lane concrete pavement, the cost benefit analysis doesn't come out very well because it's very expensive. It's essentially a slab job. Federal funds are not used for maintenance more or less. I mean, it needs to have some type of improvement. Um, the asphalt overlay type projects, the cost benefit on those is good. So they can score very high because some of the components are traffic volumes, which we do very well at, um, capacity analysis, safety, um, which we also do very well at. And where we get uh, nicked is on uh, cost benefit because it's very expensive to uh, try and do some type of maintenance repair on a, a concrete road that's already a five lane. 
The capacity ones we score very well on when we're going from a two lane to a five or a five lane to a six lane boulevard because we have the volumes. Um, so we score very well on those and that's why we have, we've got a, a ton of money coming in the future for those types of projects. Straight maintenance, federal dollars really are difficult to try and get that money because it's just how, two categories, surface transportation, which is STP, and the other is category C. C is more for congestion uh, type projects. Uh, the STP is more safety based. So those are, the uh, rating forms are based on those, primarily on those factors. <coughs> So a maintenance type job in an STP category, um, it doesn't fit very well if the cost is too high. It's really a cost per square foot. And when you're looking at straight concrete, uh, unless you're doing a mill and overlay um, on that concrete pavement, the cost benefit's pretty low. But we do continue to work with the county. We've done 50-50 sharing with them in the past. Um, Tri-party, we still have a little bit of that coming this year, almost 300,000 and almost 300 next year um, that we're gonna use. Um, but other than that, the county doesn't have money, but one of the things we're looking for in the future is, is there a way that we can do some type of cost sharing, something along the lines of a 50-50, because we've got some section crooks. One big one up by 75 is an area that's, it's just not gonna last. And they recognize that because they're spending so much money maintaining it right now, they're to the point that, you know what, we need to figure out something because we can't continue to maintain this thing it's costing so much money for them to maintain it. And I think that might be the impetus to get them off the snide, to get them moving forward to, to do something. Yeah. So the money we're spending on John R in the northern section up around Square Lake and Round Lake, that's how much is Troy, how much is County? 80, 20. 80, 20. 80, 20. So if you come south on John R between Waddles and Big Beaver, I know we've talked about that before, that's maintenance and if that's slab replacement, right. that's not widening lanes. So we're, right. we're not really. We're using tri-party for that. Tri-party. We only got yeah. about 300,000. Not a lot. Correct. And I mean the, the big reconstruction projects, $8 million. Um, so different magnitudes of, of scale for those types of projects. Um, 300,000 just doing straight slab work. It doesn't go very far, but we should be able to pick up a lot of the worst of the worst on that section of John R coming up this spring. And then in, later in the summer, we're going to be doing with the 2012 tri-party uh, Long Lake Westbound between Crooks and Northfield Parkway, which uh, the curb lane there, I've talked to residents that turn from the median lane to go to Northfield Parkway because that curb lane in the second lane is in such poor condition. And then two grants that come from the federal government, like the Federal Highway Administration, typically require a 20% match. And the state of Michigan uh, is at a point where they indicated they could not cover the 20% match on a lot of uh, funding that would be coming in from the federal government. And so with the help of Representative Nolenberg, we were able to uh, uh, achieve legislation that would allow municipalities that would qualify for federal funding to pay the 20% match on behalf of the state of Michigan. So that in the future, you know, we'll want to keep an eye out <coughs> I'm hearing that Big Beaver is a looming problem, that we had a problem on Big Beaver. We're going to be doing some major repair on Big Beaver in the future. That's a, that's a county road, okay? It's already multi-lane. So is that looked at as a repair yes. project? Not a lot of funding available. It goes back to that Tri-County. Yeah, in that case, and it's similar to what we ha what happened on um, Long Lake between Liberty and Crooks. I mean, that road just exploded. Um, we went 50-50 uh, share with the county um, to get that done because it was essentially turn and gravel. Big Beaver, Big Beaver, Big Beaver has not done that yet. Um, it's kind of been in the state. It's been in for a couple years. Uh, we watched it, um, and that's what you don't know is if it's going to go, when it's going to go, how fast it would go. I'd like Mr. Hootery to explain what's known as alkali silica reactivity as it relates to the Big Beaver Road. Uh, ASR, it's, it's a chemical reaction between um, the silica in the sand and the alkali in the cement. When you add water to it, there's a chemical reaction, um, creates small cracks in the pavement, um, and it can lie dormant. Um, some people like to call it a cancer of the pavement. 
Um, if you're around when, long, when it happened at Long Lake, um, it looks, if you go out in Big Beaver right now, when it's damp like today, you can see the alligator tracks. They're very, and you'll see it in a lot of curbs, um, primarily in pavements put in in the 90s to the mid 90s. Um, people started to realize something was going on. And now we put in an admixture, um, slag, um, slag cement, um, as a replacement for a portion of the concrete or the cement, which essentially slows it down and or mitigates that reaction. So we don't have it in any of the new pavements, but there's plenty of pavements throughout Oakland County that have it, uh, Big Beaver being one of them. Steve did a map a while back showing them because we are aware of where they are. We uh, keep an eye on them, but it is something that time frame, kind of the early to mid to just almost late 90s is where it was real prevalent. And uh, so it, there's no real good fix for it right now other than to remove it. We've tried a, a test section up on Long Lake where we did a overlay just of a small section out in front of uh, Glens of Carlson Park. Uh, you'll see a little section of asphalt in, in the concrete there in the sea of concrete. Um, and that was just uh, kind of an experiment to see if, if we capped, if we milled that concrete and capped it with asphalt, would it hold? And it's held up remarkably well. So that may be something that we look at for like a big beaver where you got six lanes of concrete. I mean, we have a ton of concrete out there to try and remove and replace all that concrete. It's going to be uh, multi-millions um, and very inconvenient. So, so it, no one's really ready to do a project of that size to mill and overlay a big beaver because you don't really know what's underneath. I mean, they, what they do is they take a core sample, do a petrographic analysis, look at it. You can see all the cracks and fractures in there. Um, and like when they did it on Long Lake, it was from the top to the bottom. So it's something that's out there, something we have to keep an eye on, and, and it may be something that we have to deal with um, in the future. All right. Thank you, Bill. Last time you get up here. <laughs> 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 it was just easy talk. Uh, Very enlightening. Okay, so we left off. Oops, too far. 26. 26. Thank you. Okay, so talk about sidewalk fun. Again. We have a tradition, uh, basically, of, of uh, allocating about 500000 a year for our sidewalks, or in this scenario, about uh, $3 million over uh, the six-year period. Basically, the $500,000, um, $350,000 of that would be uh, basically for our residential-type sidewalks. About 100000 of that would be is budgeted towards uh, the major road-type sidewalks, and then uh, 50000 for new construction, and that's been pretty consistent. Again, sidewalks can be found on page 188 uh, of your budget document. Uh, again, it will detail each and every project um, uh, for you in, in, in great detail. Okay, drain fund. Drain fund, again, uh, for, for at least 13 and 14, uh, we're looking at some st substantial improvements. Um, and reconstruction and maintenance, which will, should then uh, dwindle down a little bit uh, in the 15th through 18th fiscal year. Basically, of this 1.1 million, about 900,000 for the Lovington, Minnesota, De Quinter project. We have about uh, 200,000 for the DPW fence and, and, and pump uh, station, and then um, and really that's most of that's 1.1 million of it right there. Any questions on capital projects? Good. Well, then move on. Councilman Teets has a question. Oh, sorry, Councilman Teets. Just on slide nine, will the transit center be finished in 2013? Is that all right? Good point, Steve. <laughs> Uh, currently, the schedule is uh, late 2013. Uh, we'll be doing some closeout work in uh, early 2014, but uh, 
Okay. Just schedule is one thirteen. That's a good question. As with any capital project that you know may stop in the middle of a fiscal year, mm -hmm. those funds would be available, and we would reappropriate those funds to the subsequent fiscal year to complete the project. And that, I think that's with any of our roads and, and streets. Obviously, we can't. Uh, dictate when these contractors get done with them, but again, the funds would be available because we've appropriated the district. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I got a question. Yes. I'd like Tim for Snack to explain how the sidewalk replacement program works because there may be some people in, on console and in the audience that aren't aware of, of how the mechanics on how it works. I'll try to make it a little shorter than Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line. We have about 32 square miles in the city of Troy. Um, several years ago, um, back in the 1989, I believe, we started repairing sidewalks in the city of Troy. At that point, because the subdivisions were scattered around the community, we would go based on the oldest uh, subdivisions and then inspect those and then set up a repair program. Uh, about eight years ago, we got to the point where that was a little too scatterbrained of an operation, but it worked very well for those early years. So what we did is we took and looked at what an appropriate repair rotation schedule would be and to make it um, practical, yet what would fit within you know, the, the legal system, what they looked at for uh, an appropriate so we would not have liability. And so what we did is our local subdivisions, we have on a 12-year rotation. Our mile road sidewalks we put on uh, a six-year rotation and the reason that we did that uh, there's so much more construction activity and just things going on that you end up with more need for repair on those major roads so uh, that's where we're at today we look at the, reduce our liability and the property owners liability do those inspections uh, on our 12-year uh, program those are in the subdivisions what you look at with that is uh, we pay for if there's uh, a utility failure or a city tree that's lifting the sidewalk uh, and some other scenarios, but the majority of the other items, which would be uh, trench settlement when the house was built or just the sidewalk that's lifted or settled, that's the responsibility of the property owner. When we go into uh, these programs, uh, we bill back to the property owners and it depends on, you know, which house has what different uh, criteria that we're looking at, but it, it's roughly 40 to 60 percent each year that we actually return to the city uh, that we build the residence for that. But that's how we got to our current program. Any questions on that? Okay, continuing on, uh, we're going to talk about enterprise funds now. Now, enterprise funds are self-funded uh, funds. In other words, they're used to account for services that are funded through user charges from people that use the services. Again, our golf courses are would be that. Uh, our water sewer funds and the aquatic center would also be categorized as enterprise funds, and we'll talk about each individually. <coughs> Basically, I'm going to give you a, a couple of different uh, scenarios, both on a cash flow basis and on a net asset basis, kind of like what we did with the enterprise funds last year or last week. Um, should be noted that the aquatic center, uh, we're going to be budgeting or estimating uh, revenues in the amount of about 590,000 uh, for 2013. Uh, our outflows will be about uh, 436,000, leaving basically 152,000 of, of cash inflows before the use of capital outlay. Now, we're not, we're not budgeting any capital outlay for the Aquatic Center uh, for 2013 because, and, and I'll show you on the, on the next slide, because the Aquatic Center basically is in a deficit net asset position. And we're going to be required to uh, 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 do something with that to satisfy some state requirements that usually they require a deficit elimination plan. I've been in contact with the state and working with them in, in resolving that problem and assuring them that uh, we are making headway and, and that uh, we will uh, soon conquer 
basically this challenge. And as you can see, from a net asset standpoint, again, we still have the inflows, but then you have to account for depreciation uh, because really you are using capital assets to provide those services. So again, in, in 12, we were looking at from an economic loss of 81,000 to for 13, we're only expecting a $21,000 economic loss, which will help, again, right the ship for, for the aquatic center and, and put it on basically a, a, a financially uh, um, a stable position. And we expect that within the next two years. Next, we're going to talk about um, the Sanctuary Lake. Again, the Sanctuary Lake uh, is it, another one of those funds that's had challenges for the past uh, few years. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at it from a cash flow standpoint. Again, uh, this uh, specific, our golf courses are now run by uh, our management company, Billy Casper Golf. So a lot of the, these numbers are related to their projections uh, that are given to us. Again, we're looking at uh, increasing revenues uh, basically by about 70,000 uh, compared to 2012. We are looking at uh, having net inflows uh, from operations of about 318,000, uh, which is, um, helps pay really for our capital outlay and more primarily our debt service. So if we weren't generating uh, some operating income, we would still have this debt service obligation out there from a cash flow standpoint, about 868,000. So as such that we can generate some operating income, our cash loss for this particular year, year is going to be about 608000 If we look at it from a net asset standpoint, or again, from an economic standpoint, um, again, we're looking at generating about 318000 economic value. Then you have depreciation expense of about 298000 and interest expense on that debt of about 468000 so from an economic standpoint, we're going to lose some economic uh, 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 substance in there of about 448000 for 2013. Again, this has been typically been running in the 600000 range per year. So we're still show we are showing some improvement and continued improvement as we go into the future. Sylvan Glen, on the other hand, uh, from a cash flow standpoint, um, is it, looking uh, uh, very good. Again, it looks like we're going to generate about 265000 from operations uh, before capital outlay, and the budget capital outlay about $44,700 primary primarily for the golf carts. Again, we're looking at having a, a cash inflow, in this case, of about 220000 if we look at it from a golf course operations, this, this inflow will help offset some of that, that loss that we've seen in Sanctuary Lake because we would account for both of them as a golf course type operation, even though we budget for them separately. Again, from an economic or net asset standpoint, um, we're looking at having income before depreciation of about 265,000. Depreciation expenses about 147,000, leaving about 118,000 of economic gain uh, for uh, Silva Glen. And again, we would expect for any enterprise fund to have some kind of economic gain because just for the mere fact that capital assets as you go through years should gain value. As you go through, your assets are worth more today than that same asset was. 10 or 20 years ago. So you would expect, by the very nature, uh, to have economic gains in these enterprise type funds. Let's go ahead and talk about the sewer fund. Again, the sewer fund from a cash flow analysis, we're looking at spending, uh, uh, of having net inflows of about 1.4 million from operations. Again, I've adjusted this a little bit since last time. I thought uh, our sewer administration was a little high, so I downgraded that a little bit. And that's really what's in that administration is the cost for sewer that we're being charged from both Oakland County and the Evergreen Farmington districts, okay? So again, from a cash flow standpoint, 
uh, from operations, we're looking at generating about 1.4 million before our capital outlay, as we explained earlier, of about 1.8 million. So the net cash effect of, for this fund is is uh, going to be using about 386,000 of of cash to keep the system updated. From an economic standpoint, of course, we don't use that the, that new sewer um, capital all in one year, so we depreciate it over its useful life. Again, uh, the 1.4 million from operations before depreciation. Depreciation expense is typically about 1.1 million. So again, we have an economic gain of about 313,000 uh, that were budgeted for 2013. Again, as you can see, what, what's nice is, is that, that we are putting in the system what we're depreciating. So we're not just letting it deteriorate. We are replenishing Tom, that capital. Tom, I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry, to go back to slide 36 uh, with Sylvan Glen Golf Course, the cash flow analysis. Yes. I apologize. Um, the capital outlay in yes. 2012 dropped 700,000. Yes, and again, this is budget. The 831,000 because they were budgeting and putting it in a new uh, irrigation system. Got it. Primarily, we're not going to do that. At least at this point, at least pull the trigger on that. Okay. So. I believe that's sure. correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Again, we're trying to look at golf course operations in the hall, mm -hmm. and, and we think that 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 money at this point can help shore up maybe some of the shortfalls of, of some of the debt service at least for right now. On uh, slide 38, the sewer administration. Can you just explain the difference between 12 and 13? Or you said was that an adjustment? You said. No, no, no. Well, no. This what I what I said is, is sewer administration has the cost for sewer services, and it's not just admin. In other words, it's the charges that we receive uh, that are charged to us from Oakland County and from the Evergreen, uh, Farmington uh, Township. I think in your original ones that was around 11 million. I took that down about 800 thousand because I thought that that it was a little high. And that we would do better than that. If you look at yours, it looked like we'd have a cash flow expenditure of about 1.2 million, and we're about 400,000. Okay. okay. Sewer system again for uh, um, capital outlay projects uh, for the current year and for the five subsequent years is about, if we added that up, that's about uh, 9.7 million, 9 million 675,000 to be exact. Again, the, these improvements are made possible by reviewing the rates and consumption uh, every, every year and not by issuing debt, which is, which is kind of nice. I see a lot of communities out there that have to issue debt for both their water and sewer improvements and so far we've had the ability to 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 use our own uh, wherewithal or our own funding to to make those uh, improvements those capital improvements again when we talk about water and sewer it's it's, it's again it's consumption times rate think about this in taxes is millage times taxable value right we we still have to have a certain amount of volume to make the world go round and, and I think it's probably worth noting that both in the sewer system and when we're going to what we're going to talk about next in the water system is our budget is 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 we're budgeting or projecting the use of about 480,000 MCS which is 1000 cubic feet of sale. So if I'm selling widgets I need to sell 480,000 of them at the rate that we're proposing to to come out with these financial incomes out out <clears throat> okay, so again, it should be noted that it's that there's a premise under under there of selling so many units. Okay, let's talk about the water fund again from a cash flow perspective. Uh, oh, what for sewer? Okay. Again, in, uh, in your document on page 227, talks about those individual sewer uh, uh, projects uh, in detail. 
And I don't know if we want to talk about any more detail of what's going on with the sewer. We can certainly bring somebody up to do that. Good? Um, yes. Maybe you can just explain to us, you know, what is 12 towns, what is a green farm, you know, what specifically is that? Sure. Sure. There's uh, three sewer districts in Troy. Uh, the Evergreen Farmington is primarily the western part, and uh, I believe there are seven communities involved in the Evergreen Farmington. Um, we're, we're at the, uh, the high end of that uh, sewage district. It flows through Birmingham, Southfield, Beverly Hills. I'm not sure I'm going to get all the communities, but uh, uh, that's the Evergreen Farmington district. And we have the 12 towns district in the southern portion of the city. That's a combined sewer area, whereas the others are uh, separate sewers. Combined sewer is storm and sanitary. And then we have the Troy district on primarily the central and eastern part of, uh, of Troy. These three districts, um, the sewage goes to through county interceptors. And then the county interceptors, it goes to Detroit. So Detroit bills the county, and the county bills us for each of those three districts. And if you ride a bicycle, it's always easier going southeast because the northwest corner of Troy, if I recall, is about 220 feet higher in elevation than the southeast corner of Troy. Everything flows. Yeah. And the 12 towns is called 12 towns because there are 12 towns. <laughs> <laughs> that was a major project, what, about 10 years ago? <coughs> it was the, uh, the GW gate, the George yeah. W. Kuhn um, drain, which was a major upgrade of the um, uh, sewer system in the both towns. It yeah, kind of overflow into the Red Run drain, which eventually goes out to Wilson Park. That all 12 of our surrounding communities are sharing. Okay. Um, there was a lot of information about updates and projects that are going to be required in one of these um, three specifically in Evergreen mm -hmm. Farmington. Um, did, did I read that correctly? That there's sorry, could you there's a, a considerable amount of money that needs to be set aside for projects in one of these districts specifically. Is that correct? Yes, that's the uh, Evergreen Farmington district, and for um, approximately six years, perhaps even longer, we've been under what's called an administrative consent order from the DEQ, and what that order is about is to find a way to eliminate the uh, overflows that take place to the river uh, during uh, heavy rain events and there is a an administrative consent order to the county and then there is a consent order um, that involves all of the member uh, communities to the Evergreen Farmington as well and each community uh, Troy being one we have uh, what's called a short-term corrective action plan it's a uh, multi-year uh, plan which uh, studies the sewer system in the Evergreen Farmington to find out why is it surcharging, why do we have overflows. And uh, we're doing that by uh, doing meter studies and identifying where there's some extreme flow coming into the sewer system and we have projects to eliminate that. That's part of the short term to identify what's causing the problem and the long term corrective action plan is to uh, identify a solution, uh, the cost of the solution among um, a number of uh, possible solutions to select one and to go ahead and, and implement that. Now you see in the budget there is a, um, uh, the largest one there is uh, 13 million and then that's the project cost. That would be uh, 13 million is what we think it might cost to eliminate the uh, uh, overflows in the district as a whole. And our share being, I think it's shown as 600,000, perhaps. Then we have other projects that are <coughs> uh, within our area of the Evergreen Farming itself, such as uh, sewer lining and manhole repair work um, that we need to do in order to get down to the flow that we need to get down to um, in order to eliminate uh, sewer system overflows. So, Right now, and we've been carrying those numbers for years because it's kind of a moving target. 
the schedule of the consent order and the short-term and long-term correction action plans. They, they seem to be a moving uh, and living thing. Um, there's been extensions and then extensions upon extensions. So right now, what you see in there are essentially <coughs> placeholders, projects, a lot of projects that we don't quite know what they're going to be yet, but we're going to have to do them sooner or later. And it, it's been in the project for, or been in the budget, I should say, for a number of years because those the length, the term of those consent orders seem to be changing all the time and get pushed down the road. So it's a complicated issue, I hope I... I just have a follow-up question. Basically, what, what the problem occurs is when you have stormwater infiltration into the sanitary sewer system. Correct. Is that the basic problem? Yes. So you're trying to eliminate that stormwater getting into the sanitary sewer, into the sanitary sewer. So. You know, so then the engineers have to find out how to how to do that, how to we, stop we that. Do, we do have an overflow point uh, <laughs> on the uh, on Beach Road um, when we get a heavy rainfall, so we're working to eliminate that. And from our perspective, I mean, it's a safety issue first and foremost, but it's also an economic issue. Mm -hmm. We have to put this large amount of money in to try to solve a problem because if we don't do that one, there's legal ramifications, safety ramifications ramifications but also there's financial ramifications it looks like because the penalties are we may steady. not and this year we're, we're probably not going to spend all that money but uh, we are going to be doing metering we are doing uh, manhole rehab and uh, we are in the uh, early stages of a of a new study on the evergreen farmington um, to determine what exactly is causing this overflow in light of the fact that we've already done a lot of work to reduce the extraneous flow of stormwater and infiltration into the pipes to reduce the flow to help reduce the overflows, but yet we still have them. So we're just starting a new study to try and figure out um, why it's still happening the way it is. How long will that take, do you think? Uh, it's probably going to be uh, a year and a half to two years. Questions on okay. Okay, we're talking about the water fund, and again, we'll just recap uh, where we left off. Again, we got about 15.7 million that uh, we're going to budget for revenues based on about selling 480,000 MCFs. What's an MCF? Uh, it's a thousand cubic feet. Right? Okay. From that, uh, we believe that we will generate, again, about $2.8 million uh, from operations before, again, expenditures into the system. Uh, we're budgeting about $5.1 million of capital improvements. So from a cash flow standpoint, it would be a reduction in our, uh, in our spendable resources of about uh, uh, $2,252,000 for 2013. Again, as we know, capital outlay is really, from an economic source, an investment into the system. Again, from an economic basis, we're still projecting the same revenues and expenditure sources, except we have depreciation expense now instead of capital outlay. And typically, the, the use of our capital resources is about $210 million. So again, it's, a, it's still a nice scenario that, that we are still investing back into our, our water system and we're not le letting it deteriorate. Again, uh, primary estimates for, for the water system as far as capital needs are going into the future is uh, slightly over $29 million uh, for the current year and the next five fiscal years. Again, <coughs> These revenues are generated uh, through the review uh, of uh, levels of consumption and, and making sure that, that uh, the rates that are being charged are commensurate with uh, uh, the investment into the system. On page 209 then would show then in detail uh, the uh, water capital uh, that were um, projects that are budgeted to be done. And do we need any detail on those specific projects. <clears throat> ah, 
Moving forward then. Let's go ahead and take a look then at, at our uh, <coughs> rate history and our MCF history. Again, uh, we are, um, <coughs> excuse me, we're uh, budgeting or we're requesting then a, a rate increase less than last year. Last year was a rate increase of uh, about $5.10 per MCF. Uh, this year is about $4.15. Each one is about 8% and that's basically exactly what the rates went up that Detroit Water is charging us and Oakland County and the Evergreen Farmington district are charging us for both water and sewer. So again, this isn't necessarily a rate increase from, from city operations, but basically the pass through from uh, the providers of our water and sewer services. Yes. Um, looks like the rate increase has increased every year since 06, 07. Will it ever stop or will it uh, Detroit continue to just increase the rates? I mean, isn't that just a function. I can give you a couple of high points on that. Um, over the last uh, few years, some of their increases have been greater due to uh, their chemical cost. The chemical cost, some of them have gone up 800% in certain chemicals that they have to add into the, the system in order to make it, uh, you know, make it able for us to drink and to be safe. Uh, the other portion of uh, that function is that uh, when Tom talked about, you know, the rate times the volume, uh, he will be showing you shortly how the consumption has gone and plummeted uh, in Troy, and, and that is reflective of all southeast Michigan. Uh, a lot of the industrial uh, community is no longer there, and there's no water consumption, so that water and sewer, when you have a, a base investment that you have to protect with money you take and look at when you get your revenues are down because the volume is not out there that cost is still there and that's where you've seen uh, a lot of those rates go up in the last three four five years now uh, in the future if things gradually increase you know what they look at every year is to keep those two lines parallel to each other don't know what those rate increases will be. Uh, they're positioning themselves by doing some less capital work in order to have lower uh, rate increases in the future. Those committees that we sit on to listen to this, uh, that's the direction they're going. Who, who actually manages the Detroit Water System? Detroit Water System is managed by the DWSD, Detroit Water Sewer uh, System. Uh, now, if you've been watching uh, Detroit recently, uh, they had a lot of uh, combination uh, of what they, they had was that the city of Detroit and the water system were the same with respect to the retirement and the employees and, and a lot of what was going on. They're actually moving uh, under uh, what the, the governor's agreement with them to separate that out so that it's more standalone. It's a large enough organization that uh, it, they shouldn't be, in their opinion, affecting each other. So uh, you will see some changes there in the future. I had a quick question about, uh, we have an ordinance now that we can't water at night, and that was supposed to affect water bills. Where, is that shown in that chart, or not necessarily? No, it's not shown in this chart, but we do have on our website, uh, and. I don't know if it's on there currently. We'll be updating it very soon because we're into the spring season when we don't want you to water. And it's actually, we don't want you to water the other you know, right? in, from <laughs> early in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. And it has affected, and we have shown uh, over the first three years of that program that we've shaved that peak off during the day, and that's how we've been able to keep our rates down. Um, looking at what rates uh, increases we had, and right now you shouldn't see because uh, any more uh, drops in that, but in the first three years, we saved about 15% uh, increases that other communities got that we didn't because we had that ordinance. So if you were to take that ordinance away, I kind of anticipate we'd have an additional 15% increase because we keep our peaks off so that we don't have to 
uh, put that extra burden on the pumps and the electric systems and those types of things that are in the core expenses of their operation. Thank you. And again, then I believe that uh, Detroit Water, they used to, to charge you by the MCL, but they've, they've changed their rate structure too, have they not? Now you have a fixed portion, so regardless if you got one MCF or 480,000, you still have a fixed cost that they are going to charge you at this time, which is different than the rate structure prior. Yes, years ago it used to be just a, uh, they take and add every, all the costs into one pot and then it was, uh, they charged based on a, a unit. But over a period of time, there's a, a committee, a TAC committee, a technical advisory committee that all the communities have an opportunity to be on and, and we've had a representative on there um, for the last 20 years. And what we looked at is to, to make it fair, uh, you've got communities out there that are using uh, larger volumes of water and are putting them on lawns and things like that. Well, that base cost was not being spread to all those communities, what we felt, on an equal basis. And so what they are moving to is to have some the base cost, all the, the solid uh, infrastructure that's out there, the pipes, the plants, and those types of things as a base cost that everybody pays based on their uh, contract amount. Uh, and then you get the actual cost of producing the water, the pumping, the electricity, the chemicals, and those things are variable and those get charged based on the number of gallons that you, you use actually or you purchase. Any further questions on Thank you. Okay. Any question then on uh, our rates and the MCFs that we're using or budgeted to use? Again, here is an example of the water consumption uh, since 2001. Uh, of course, we see a, a dramatic decrease um, starting in uh, uh, basically 2007, certainly in 8, 9, and 10. Uh, if we want to look at 2008, is, that's about 560,000 MCFs. That's about 493,000 MCFs, 448,000, and again, we're consistent about 480,000 for from 2011 what we're projecting for 2012 and budgeting for 13. So. And if I were to just uh, get one short comment on this is it, you really some of these numbers have to do with uh, the economy and people purchasing water. The other portion of it has to do and if you remember last year we had just a very wet wet spring mm -hmm. and early summer nobody was irrigating in that early part. That's a large part uh, of what we sell water. Um, I don't know what the percentage is now, but I, I know a few years ago, uh, if you had 100% of the water that we sold, 33% of that was used for outdoor use, and 67% was for you know consumption, the base uh, stuff you use for uh, showers, laundries, you know all of those types of things. So uh, irrigation plays a big part in that as we get uh, rain events during the year. Thank you. If we want to look at a, a, an average residential bill, base, basically the average resident uses about 3.9 MCFs per quarter. Based on the 2012 rates, uh, that bill would be $198.90. Again, uh, based on our, our um, proposed rates, that bill would be now 215 which is basically a $16.19 increase per quarter mm -hmm. water. And again, you know, from a, from a percentage-wise, that's, you know, again, about 8%. Any questions on our enterprise funds? Okay, so the water and sewer rate, is that, that could be described as, is that a user fee? It is a user fee. I mean, it's it's the fee design. Five times a day, I'm going to pay more than. Don't do it between. <laughs> <laughs> Only late at night when I shower, right? Exactly. Um, but it, I mean, it's strictly a user fee. 
That's right. That's that. That's what it. Each one of those is designed to maintain the system itself. It's a, a again with any of those enterprise funds, they're self-contained systems designed that that the users of those services pay for those services. It's quite a significant yes. decrease. Thank you. It's quite a significant decrease from 2003 to 2010. Why then would you suspect there's going to be a spike in 2011, 2012? Well, that, well, what accounts for that spike? Maybe you... you I, I'm you not sure if I understand. Well, it's not a, a spike, but we, it's clearly we've been using 480,000 MCFs. Can you put it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, from 440? 40, yeah. Oh, 49, yes. I, if you look here, uh, it, it appears that there's it's a major drop, but what you have to realize, this chart goes down to here. See, it's 400... Uh, yeah. So okay, it's, it's a little skewed, but you can't, it'd be difficult for us to put and actually show those differences. But the, the difference between here and there is not that great because, it, you know, your chart just it resembles that. that. That's the biggest, I think, what you're looking at is why there's such a drop. And it's, it's not as critical as what you're looking at. Good point. I'm going to have to rescale that. Get some perspective. This is not really a, a, an enterprise fund question, but I think it's appropriate to ask at this point. We don't treat the community center as an enterprise fund, but yet there's revenue <coughs> in and their expenses. This council a few years ago, you know, brought the community center was on the chopping block. Basically, it was agreed by this council that at the council at the time that we would keep the community center open based on it being able to be cost neutral or a profit center. And there's nowhere, it's not an enterprise fund, so I'm asking the question now because it's sort of similar to that. Sure. How do we account for the community center? Is it a break even? How do, how do we? Sure. If, if, uh, let's, let's let Jeff Bigler, our recreation director, take the uh, first uh, answer of this, if we may. Yes, the, the community center does pay for itself. The, it does uh, uh, bring in revenues to offset all of the expenses related to it. The only exception is debt service costs. Uh, the Downtown Development Authority and the City of Troy jointly issued bonds, or they, they issued bonds on their own, excuse me, to fund the adaptive reuse of Old Troy High as about 135,000 square foot community center. So when Jeff talks about us meeting expenditures, it's very similar to Sanctuary Lake that if you take a look at the operating costs and our expenditures, we actually make money but when you pay the debt service on the bond for Sanctuary Lake, you lose money. Uh, but Mr. Bigler is correct in that in terms of the operations, uh, it's self-sufficient. We, we monitor that. Right. We certainly do. And on page 107 uh, of your budget document, of your budget packet, mm -hmm. I did highlight that we budgeted service revenues of about $3.2 million to cover associated costs of basically three million one hundred and seventy one thousand so um, and again that's highlighted on page 107 in your bu budget document and also on page 106 it, it shows you the total of, of those of those uh, business units that I'm accounting for that cost and that's the recreation uh, business unit, the senior programs business unit, and the community center business unit. So the total cost recovery was the three million one hundred seventy-one thousand for those three units. Does that help answer your question? Uh, it does. I had it highlighted here. Thank you. define other service charges that there's always these columns that have exorbitant amounts of money in them called other service charges other service charges how do we define other service charges in 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 your budget document here basically that would be any contract any other services that are not really personnel services or supplies so your contractor services are in there um, <coughs> utilities uh, <coughs> uh, tax refunds, any of those other ancillary charges. Where are those detailed? 
and about, I don't know, 50,000 accounts. That I can print you out uh, uh, the detail of all that. But, but obviously, for, for our purposes, we summarize all that. Just like personnel services is probably 10, 15 different accounts that make that up. But I can certainly get you details of what those other service charges are. But that's basically what it is. Again, when it comes to our costs, we got three ba basic categories. The major one, right, we talked about, right, in our last presentation is personnel, right? And, um, and uh, next were supplies, and then, again, our other service charges are, again, our other contract. That's, yeah, basically everything else. Questions on the enterprise funds? Just one. Yes. Just going way back to slide 32, charges for services. We have like a 20% increase in our aquatic center revenues. Yes. Is that because we changed the fee structure? Yes. Okay. Yes. We've again, we've, we've been we we've not been generating enough revenues right. to, to support the system. It's a self-supporting system, and, and again, I think overall they're modest increases. Mm -hmm. Yes, five dollars for a we're, we're Yes, we're proposing a five dollar increase in a season pass, mm -hmm. fifty cent increase in a daily pass. Very modest. We're still uh, under uh, the industry cost for those daily season. Okay. Thank um, you. And I sorry I didn't ask earlier, Jeff, but do you have a sense on the number of visitors that visit the aquatic center on an annual basis, as well as those that visit the community center? Uh, well, we've always used the number of around a million people visiting the uh, community center on an annual basis. Okay. Uh, our uh, figures for 2011 for the uh, last uh, season, swimming season, the summer of 2011, we had 52, over 52,000 total attendants at, uh, at, at the aquatic center, correct. So both facilities get great play yeah. with uh, most of the camp. <laughs> well, at this uh, point in the presentation, uh, it's uh, basically a scheduled break. If you'd like to, or continue. I'm just out of notch when I said no, I break. Like good. I like slide 51. <laughs> <laughs> Take a little break. Okay. Favorite, favorite slide so far. Favorite slide so far. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.